My name is Alex Schumacher, and I have the pleasure of serving on your board of trustees. As a board member, it is also my privilege to welcome everyone to our service this morning. Today, the service, the service will focus on the call for racial justice, a theme fundamental to the functioning of a democratic, fair, and peaceful society beginning, of course, with our own interpersonal relationships. The recent events in the US have done much to emphasize the impact of situations in which racist attitudes and racial antagonisms are deeply ingrained, namely the stark difference between the DC authorities' lackadaisical planning <coughs> and failure to properly anticipate the appalling invasion of the Capitol building last Wednesday, <clears throat> excuse me, and the extreme measures taken previously in anticipation of the Black Lives Matter demonstrations. These are just the most immediate, disturbing and glaring examples. However, we here in Canada are not immune from such abuses. Just speak to anyone from the indigenous, black, or other non-white communities, 
We need to be cognizant of and engaged in promoting all aspects of racial justice, from the explicit to the implicit, and in seeking to achieve a society in which there is a broad commitment to justice, mutual respect and understanding between all citizens. I think today's presenters, the Reverend Pat Trudeau and Dr. Wilburn Hayden, will do much to enhance our awareness of how this could and should be achieved. Whoever you are, whoever you love, and wherever you are on your journey of faith or search for meaning, you are truly welcome. If you are visiting or connecting for the first time, or for the first time in a long time, know that we are most grateful to have you with us. We come together in a beloved community to grow in wisdom, welcome and deepen relationships and act for a just and sustainable world. I personally am a committed Unitarian because I believe in the principles for which we stand and because I believe that together we can have a positive impact on our broader society. We acknowledge that this meeting takes place on the traditional territories of the people of the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Sigsiga, Peguni, and Gainai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. We acknowledge that we are all treaty people. I have just one announcement, which is to urge everyone to consider offering something for the time and talent auction. The deadline for submitting your auction proposals to Lids Blackstock is January the 16th. Your auction item can be offered any time between now and December the 31st, 2021. So it could be something in the fall, post-COVID restrictions, or it could be something this spring that fully respects COVID re restrictions. And we will now go to Lynn Newton <clears throat> for our chalice lighting. We light our chalice this morning with a prayer written by Reverend Joseph Cherry. If we have any hope of transforming the world and changing ourselves, we must be bold enough to step into our discomfort, brave enough to be clumsy about it, loving enough to forgive ourselves and others, May we, be, as a people of faith, be granted the strength to be so bold, so brave, and so loving. With these words, let us light our chalice. Good morning. My name is Pam Rickey, and I'm your worship service facilitator this morning. And, um, I greet you welcome to today's service, and especially to our guest service presenter, the Reverend Pat Trudeau, accompanied by her husband, Dr. Wilburn Hain. This service is the final component of the workshop series, Dismantling Racism in Canada, that Reverend Trudeau and Dr. Hayden began with us back in October, 2020, unpacking racism in Canada and exploring ways for us to become allies in dismantling the racial barriers in our congregations and in the wider community. Reverend Patricia Trudeau is a Unitarian Universalist minister whose previous careers include social work, counseling and children's religious education. She and her family have been active in neighborhood UU congregation in Toronto since 2007. 
Reverend Trudeau has a wealth of skills and interests in pastoral care, social justice, particularly focused on her work in racial justice and building skills as a white ally in teaching and dance. Dr. Wilburn Hayden has been a university professor and social worker since 1973. He teaches and writes from critical race and anti-oppression perspectives. Growing up in the segregated Southern USA, he knows of the racial injustice struggle in the USA and Canada firsthand. His social work practice experiences include being the chief social worker in a state prison, organizing within disadvantaged communities, directing a human services agency, and involvement in political campaigns in North America. I'd like to thank them both for their workshop and for this service. I'd also like to take a minute to express um, our appreciation to the many others involved in bringing this worship service to life today. Mitch Mitchell and Hendrik Shank, our AV team for today, Ev Duar for the PowerPoint slides, music director Jane Perry, DRE Sheila McMaster for keeping us connected with our children and youth, Lynn Nugent and Mariana Louise Kovar for our chalice table and chalice words, and Alex Schumacher for our board greeting and offertory words. And finally, special thanks to Jane Perry and Lynn Nugent for helping me put all of this together today. Good morning, friends. It's good to be together with you again in this virtual environment. I have participated in Pat and Wilburn's anti-racism workshop, anti-Black racism workshop over these last many weeks, and I'm grateful for my learnings. Some of my learnings are what it means to be a white ally and a white musician um, performing African-American spirituals and civil rights songs in a Unitarian context. I recognized as a white person, mine is not a history of enslavement of great grandmothers and great grandfathers, but as a white ally, I can stand with those who claim that history. Mine is not a history as a white person of having directly experienced anti-black racism leveled at me, but as a white ally, I can stand with people who have had that experience with, with our black siblings and cousins. So in singing through our music this morning, if you don't happen to be black yourself, consider how you can step up as an ally to black siblings and cousins in singing this music. Let's sing together our first song. This is an African-American folk song called, I'm on my way to the freedom land. Here we go. Thank you. 
you, Jane. That was that was wonderful. And today, uh, the youth are going to be doing Chorus of Faiths, Beloved Community, and they're going to focus on what interfaith work can look like. And they're going to be learning about the 1965 March at Selma. And as an author, feminist, and social activist, Bell Hooks says, if we want beloved community, we must stand for justice, have recognition for the difference without attaching the difference to privilege. And you might be wondering, what are the children doing today? And I have this wonderful book called Anti-Racist Baby. And we're going to be taking an in-depth look in that with the children today. And I'm going to read it for all of you this morning. So I'm going to do my screen sharing here so you can all see this wonderful book. And it's called The Anti-Racist Baby by Ibram X. Kendi with illustrations by Ashley Lukashevsky. All right. Anti-racist baby is bred, not born. Anti-racist baby is raised to make society transform. Babies are taught to be racist or anti-racist. There's no neutrality. Take these nine steps to make equity a reality. Number one, open your eyes to all skin colors. Anti-racist baby learns all the colors, not because race is true. If you claim to be colorblind, you deny what is right in front of you. Number two, use your words to talk about race. No one will see racism if we only stay silent. If we don't name racism, it won't stop being so violent. Number three, point at policies as the problem, not people. Some people get more while others get less because policies don't always grant equal access. Number four, shout, there's nothing wrong with people. Even though all races are not treated the same, we are all human, anti-racist baby can proclaim. Number five, celebrate all of our differences. Anti-racist baby doesn't see certain groups as better or worse. Anti-racist baby loves a world that's truly diverse. Number six, knock down the stack of cultural blocks. Anti-racist baby appreciates how groups speak and dance and create as they choose. Anti-racist baby welcomes all groups voicing their unique views. Number seven, confess when being racist. Nothing disrupts racism more than when we confess the racist ideas that we sometimes express. And number eight, grow to be an anti-racist. Anti-racist baby is always learning and changing and growing. An anti-racist baby stays curious about all people and isn't all knowing. And finally, number nine, People believe we shall overcome racism. Anti-racist baby is filled with the power to transcend my friend and does, doesn't judge a book by its cover, but reads until the end. And so I hope you all enjoyed our book today, The Anti-Racist Baby, I know I did. And it's a board book, which I think is just lovely. And now, I invite Dr. Wilburn Hayden to take us into our centering time. Whiteness is limitless possibility by Michael Eric Dyson from the book, Tears We Cannot Stop, a ceremony, a sermon to white America. My dear friends, please try to understand that whiteness is limitless possibility. It is universal and invisible. That's why many of you are offended by any reference to race. 
you believe you are acting and thinking neutrally, objectively, and without preference for one group or the next, including your own. You see yourselves as colorless until black folk dump the garbage of race on your heads. At your best moments, you may concede that you started the race game, but you swear to you, the God you love, that it is we black folk who keep it going. You have no idea how absurd that notion is. And yet we have grown accustomed to your defiance of common sense. Let us take time to tend the bonds of care and compassion in our community. We who are gathered in this virtual space this morning, each bring our own challenges, concerns, joys, and milestones. We understand ourselves to be part of a vast interconnected web of existence. What befalls one of us affects us all. As we gather this morning, we acknowledge our many concerns, both personal and in the wider world. Let each of us take time to name out loud or hold in our hearts all those who are struggling, including ourselves, naming our own fears and struggles. Let us light our candle of concern. In the midst of the challenges of our times, there's also joy. We mark birthdays, anniversaries, and other celebrations reminding ourselves that there are reasons to show gratitude. I, for one, feel very grateful right now for the mild temperatures here in Calgary and the joy that I see on the faces of children as they slide down the hill in our local park. Take time to name out loud or in the silence of your heart what you give thanks for and what joys are present for you today. Let us light our candle of joy. We light our global candle this morning to acknowledge the civil strife being experienced by our neighbor to the south. I've taken these words from Reverend Anne Barker's letter that was sent out by the Canadian Unitarian Council on Thursday, January 7th. We Unitarian Universalists are concerned by the frightful political uprisings and events which occurred in the US this week. Our spirits are with all those who are impacted and we share anger, frustration and fear around these threats. United in love, we offer expressions of solidarity, compassion, care and concern to all and most especially 
to those who have close ties to the United States. Let us light our global candle. I locate today's message in the first principle, uh, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Um, that's a, a principle we are familiar with. And I will speak later on briefly about the proposed eighth principle, which is perhaps less familiar to many people. We need the principles as we move from tolerance to acceptance, to engagement, uh, to our engagement as allies, and dare I say, as advocates. Um, love will guide us, yes, but we need the principles to keep us grounded in our search. And we are fortunate as Unitarian Universalists to have our principles. We also use our principles in, um, in relation to um, a practice, uh, a spiritual practice, whatever that is for you. I locate myself also as uh, the minister of Northwest Fellowship of Toronto, uh, having been active many years at the, um, the um, Neighborhood Unitarian Congregation. I now serve there as minister. I locate myself as a minister, wife, mother, sister, friend, and as a white ally in this struggle. And I want to tell you right off the bat <clears throat> that being the, uh, the wife of Dr. Wilburn Hayden and the mother of Donovan, a black Hayden, a black activist, does not let me off the hook. It never gives me a free pass. I have to do the work every day. And in many ways, I'm, I'm aware every day of the ways that I fail. I locate myself as the offspring of Scottish grandparents who migrated to Western Canada in 1910 to settle 160 acres of free land in Saskatchewan. Until recently, I cherished the narrative of brave homesteaders who developed virgin land, raised their four daughters and survived the depression, the drought, poverty and Canadian winters. It never occurred to me that they were colonial settlers rather than just homesteaders. They were people who took over land previously inhabited by indigenous people and there were flags. My aunt recalled finding a buffalo skull on the land and arrowheads. <clears throat> it was not until my partner, uh, Wilburn Hayden, a researcher of black history in Canada, began digging into the history of Western Canada that I had any notion that black people had lived in Western Canada, faced harsh discrimination and eventually moved or disappeared. He spoke to you about th this history on November 8th in 2020. Could they, my grandparents, have ever imagined a granddaughter married to a black man from North Carolina who would have the audacity to sniff around archives, libraries, and graveyards in, in the West looking for evidence of black settlements? This, this uh, one, one town comes to mind, Breton, uh, Alberta. We went there and uh, looked through the archives and actually crawled crawled along the ground looking for markers, graveyard markers of um, black settlers. He, uh, <clears throat> or could they have imagined having me and their black great grandson accompany Wilburn on his search? Now it's not lost on me that the focus for many Unitarian, Canadian Unitarians is often reconciliation and restorative justice for indigenous, uh, for indigenous people, and justly so. When one looks at the numbers and the history, I contend that we do not have to choose 
Anti-racism in Canada is not an either or prospect, but a concerted response that resists racism in all of its forms. Author Robin Maynard, excuse me, points uh, in, in her book, Policing Black Lives, points out that although the racial histories differ, um, that many of the results were the same, whether it was a history of annihilation or assimilation. She says, given the historical relationship between slavery and its afterlives and settler colonial colonialism, it should come as no surprise that recent racial organizing has seen a renewed effort in creating Black Indigenous solidarity. I increasingly see Black, White, Indigenous and racialized people coming together to challenge racism in all its forms and it's a delightful prospect. It was heartening to see the news coverage of Black Lives Matter protests in early June in Calgary, including a rainbow of people and to see Black Lives Matter marchers walking down Stephen Avenue Mall on Saturday, October 10th, 2020, two days after Bishop McNally students ended their anti-racism walkout with a peaceful sit-in outside Calgary's police headquarters. That was on October 8th. And thousands of Calgarians crossed the 10th Street Bridge in the YYC Justice for All Victims of Police Brutality protest in early June following the murder of George Floyd. In early June, the week of, of the murder of George Floyd and the ensuing protests, our 23-year-old son, who is a Black activist, Donovan, called us after participating in Pittsburgh demonstrations where police had responded with flares, tear gas, beatings, and rubber bullets. He had never experienced such things. I asked him how he was feeling. He said, I'm angry. I'm just angry. He said, I'm outraged. He had felt nauseous from the uh, tear gas, but he also he felt like he was doing something worthwhile as a, someone in the front lines. <laughs> On Wednesday, he came over for dinner he glanced at the screen. Of course, we were watching what was going on on Capitol Hill. And uh, he looked at a screen full of white supporters, white, white rioters supporting Trump, and just shook his head, recalling how he and others were treated by police during protests following, following George Floyd. Um, he said, we were just walking, Mom, and the police opened fire. We were protesting not destroying state property, and we were cut down repeatedly. That is what happens to black people rising up. The police respond with violence. Now, I was sitting there, I had been watching the footage for maybe two hours, and it had never occurred to me what the racial mix was. I noticed myself not noticing the whiteness of the crowd attacking the Capitol. After he had returned to Canada in August of 2020, he searched for networks of activists in Canada who were willing to confront police and face the dangers. He became an active supporter of 1492 Land Back Lane. Indigenous land defenders have mobilized, had mobilized to stop a housing development project bordering the town of Caledonia near Hamilton on territorial land. He finds himself where he, he finds himself each time he goes being a visitor, not a leader, not at the front of the line. Um, he finds himself being asked to chop wood and keep the fire going, simple tasks, because he is a visitor. Many of us end up being visitors in the struggle. Sometimes I find myself wondering what to do that something, what might, can I do that might have an impact? Often our roles seem diminished as white Unitarians and especially as we age. One friend, a tireless 70 year old activist shared what he feels 
about being impotent. He said, I feel impotent because he can no longer join the protests. I could relate. He does speak out just by writing and dialoguing about race, by supporting those who are on the front lines of the protest, but it just doesn't seem like enough. It just doesn't seem like enough. Many Unitarians feel inadequate, shy and uncertain, underqualified in speaking about racism, and so they remain silent. I might say the wrong thing is a comment I often hear. Speaking for myself, I often say too little or simply too much and at the wrong time. My humor can be ill-placed. White people have the option to speak for, uh, to speak out and wait for, or, or wait out the time, wait for a better time or say nothing. Racialized people cannot absent themselves or let their silence be inter interpreted as assent. White silence can often be seen as a form of violence by those whose voices are not heard and whose words are devalued. To go deeper into the subject, I recommend the book that I mentioned, Policing Black Lives, State Violence in Canada from Slavery to the Present. And um, I'll ask, uh, perhaps Wilbur, you would put it in the chat, in which Robert Maynard traces the living legacy of slavery across multiple institutions in Canada, shedding light on the state's role in perpetuating contemporary Black poverty and unemployment, racial profiling, law enforcement, violence, incarceration, immigration detention, deportation, exploitative migrant labor practices, disproportionate child removal, and low graduation rates. No part of Canada is innocent in the history of disrespecting of Black lives and Black bodies. For months now, I have pondered the questions posed by fellow white Canadians, many Unitarians, in the midst of anti-racism pushback, and I've decided to just simply invert the questions. People ask, why now? <laughs> why now? We're in the midst of COVID. And I ask, why not now? Why not now? It's all coming together like pieces of a puzzle uh, or, or, or perhaps as great slabs colliding and producing friction. This is no surprise. The forces of racism, injustice, policing, pandemic, and poverty are intrinsically woven together. Why such a strong reaction here in Canada? People ask, thinking that Canada is, is immune, innocent. Why not Canada? As many of you know, Canada has a history of racism that has been largely ignored. We have dis a disgraceful record of police brutality toward unarmed, racialized people that is largely not recorded or quantified. We as Canadians have not kept race-based data on police arrests or the disproportionate effects of COVID-19 on racialized people who form a large segment of the front lines of workers in healthcare and service industries. What we don't know cannot hurt us, or could it? Can it? And people ask, what has it got to do with me? Why not you? Why not me? Why not all of us? It's not uncommon to hear white people say, I am a good person. I have black neighbors and I always speak to them. I work with black people, have friends who are black. I treat everyone the same. The reality is that we inhabit a system that enculturates us from the time we can talk. Both white and non-whites absorb centuries of message about their place in society. We learn that non-whites are inferior, even before we can speak. We learn that police are good and protect us. The, policeman, the police officer is our friend. We learn that we are entitled to the best things in life and have to be careful not to let others steal or loot it. We deserve our comfort and fear disruptions. Ultimately, the question arises, what can we do? What can we do about it? What are we called to do, I ask? 
someone in the workshop put it, uh, and I, I paraphrase, but I remember her saying at the end of one of the sessions or one of the day, days, okay, I get it. I get it. Now what can we do? Good question. CUC acknowledged in a statement online that not everyone feels safe or is able to join the demonstrations, but we can all do something as we move from fear to engagement. We can all do something, no matter how small it feels. Mother Teresa said, I cannot do great things. I can only do small things with great love. Over the last few months, Wilburn Hayden and I have had the privilege of having conversations with Calgary Unitarians as part of a program of talks and workshops on race and racism in Canada. There have been powerful moments of recognition of white, white um, complicity, new insights, and a sense of yearning to be part of the solution. Repeatedly, I heard people ask, how can I make a difference? And repeatedly, we have come back to to starting with ourselves, not even doing in the beginning, but simply looking at ourselves and acknowledging internalized racism. Acknowledging how racism has shaped all of us. Racism is like an invisible gas that we all breathe. Whether one benefits directly or indirectly, we internalize racist beliefs. Racism shapes our thinking and actions often unconsciously, even if we don't want it to. Look at the story you tell about your family ancestry and consider a revised narrative. Many of us have stories about Irish, Italian, German, Polish um, immigrants who have come, uh, Ukrainian, who've come to this land and worked hard and had many sufferings, but none of the sufferings that our white ancestors experienced were because of the color of their skin. One of, another one of my stories is being a descendant of a Trudeau explorer uh, who came in 1643 as one of the, as I used to say, one of the early Canadians. I've changed that to reflect the settler status and the displacement of indigenous inhabitants. Listen more and speak less. If you are not part of a black community or a racialized community, it is important to listen to black voices first and foremost. How do they define issues? Every group of people should have self-determination when it comes to defining their own social movement and responses to injustice. Allies in any movement need to consider when it is the right time to speak and when it is the right time to listen. Just listen, learn, and follow. I found it humbling this summer when my son turned to me and said, Mother, you need to listen. And I did. I have heard, I have heard him and I have learned the hard way. And then we also have to get educated and we have to read. Supporting black people in meaningful ways is important and there are ways to do so without burdening them or asking them to educate us on racism and white privilege. This is a quote from Canadian black activist, Alicia Cox Thompson. I have noticed that my own research during seminary and in writing essays and uh, sermons often amounted in dipping in and out of books on race and racism, just simply selecting salient quotes. During the now times, I decided to follow the advice of Desmond Cole, who wrote The Skin We're In, and read books by Black authors, and to read it from front to back. Read the entire book. Read widely. Read discerningly. Talk with other people about what you read. And you have a good uh, book list at Calgary, uh, Calgary Unitarian. There's a great book list online. Um, we have added during the workshop to that list, and I hope that will, uh, that will be communicated. Speak out against racism. It is important to speak out against racism in conversations in everyday life, including family, friends, and co-workers. The ones I find most difficult are family and friends. If you are white, you have privilege that people of color do not have. 
and have access to other white people in ways that people of color generally do not. Keep up the work of reconciliation by speaking your truth plainly and clearly, and not necessarily apologetically or, or um, so carefully that the other person misses the message. Demand race-based data. In some provinces, demographic data suggests that racialized minority groups are overrepresented in reported cases of COVID-19. In Alberta, no such data is publicly available, at least not yet. And this is not absolutely true of all the provinces. A single action that will help combat systemic and institutionalized racism in Canada for Calgarians and um, Albertans is to support collecting race-based data on COVID-19 in whatever way you can do so or whatever way you feel comfortable doing. Donate to community organizations that support Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter Canada is a place to send donations. And during the workshop, we came up with many other places. They are providing, um, Black Lives Matter is providing a freedom school, um, a black history program for children in Alberta, I believe. Consider supporting the addition of an eighth principle. Consider it, research it. And that would be a whole other sermon talking about that. But I believe that um, more will be coming your way in the next few months in Calgary as, as Calgary Unitarians look at the eighth principle. The other principles do not cover it. They do, do not cover it. And what I like about this principle is that it uses action words. And uh, as Wilburn emphasizes, uh, requires us to be accountable. The principle reads, we the members Member congregations of the CU, uh, I wrote of the CUC, we're not there yet. Right now it reads, we the member congregations of the UUA covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse multicultural beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and other institutions. Finally, I want to invite all of us as Unitarians, and in particular white Unitarians, who have mostly experienced the police as operating in our interests, to pause, to breathe, to open your hearts as you, as we, begin to deeply interrogate this and other state systems. Speak out when you witness, when you witness an injustice. In conclusion, I'm not speaking today as somebody who is woke. I speak as someone who gets scared, worried, tired, sometimes overwhelmed, and sometimes I just feel stupid in my quest to support Black people in Canada. Sometimes I feel ignorant. I am often frustrated by not being at the center and feeling so peripheral to the struggle. It seems like the things I do are just so small. I'm speaking to you as a wife, mother, as a white Canadian with many privileges who experiences racist thoughts and sentiments every day and makes mistakes. At those times, when I want to take a break, I ask myself the hard questions and begin again. Not questions like, what's wrong with them? Or how can I fix this? But rather questions like, what are my privileges? What can I do differently in my own life? And how am I complicit? I'm speaking to as a UU minister who still believes that despite missteps and setbacks in our UU denominations past, we are making progress. Our faith is grounded in principles that call us to justice, equity and respect in human relations for the dignity of all humans. I just want to hear those principles spoken out a little louder, called out a little clearer toward collective action and engagement, accountable action and engagement. I am in favor of the proposed eighth principle that is being considered by the UUA and is being discussed and studied here in Canada. I would 
I would be glad to expand on that in any discussions we have in the future. There is a deeper layer of understanding of race and racism that our faith calls us to pursue. May we find that understanding and the strength to take the path forward. Today, I ask one more hard question. What can we do to address the harm done to Black, Indigenous, and racialized people in our life, communities, and congregations? Whatever it is, let's do it together. We can all do something. In the words of Melanie Moore, a, song, a songwriter, workshop leader, activist, you got to put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Don't give up hope. You're not alone. Don't you give up. Keep moving on, Calgary Unitarians. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Reverend Pat, for your message this morning. So let's sing that song by Melanie Demore. Melanie Demore lives in Oakland, California, a, a black singer, songwriter, social activist, and an amazing musician. This is a song that Euphonia has been learning on Thursday nights. We really love this one, and um, I'm here to teach it to all of us this morning. This is a song in which we'll sing the chorus together, but then the verses are call and response. And what that means is that I sing a line and you sing it right back to me and then we regroup on the chorus. Let's sing together, put one foot in front of the other, and lead with love. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Don't give up hope. You're not alone. Don't you give up. Keep moving on. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Lift up your eyes. Don't you despair. Look up ahead. The path is there. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. I know you're scared and I'm scared too. But here I am, right next to you. We ought to put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. We ought to put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love and lead with love and lead with love please take a few minutes now to appreciate our connections to each other and to the broader community even if many of them have to be maintained virtually right now and to recognize that we are truly together together we have a voice for the common good that reaches well beyond our immediate community. Our web of connections, our community, is especially important in this challenging time. This congregation's vitality and ability to play an important role for each of us and in the wider community is sustained by each of our willingness to give and to receive. So, Please consider now how you might further your role with this congregation 
either financially or by contributing your time, knowledge and skills. Thank you very much. For our closing words, Affirmation of Hope by Loretta Williams. We bearers of the dream affirm that a new vision of hope is emerging. We pledge to work for that community in which justice will be actively present. We affirm that there is struggle yet ahead, yet we know that in the struggle is the hope for the future. We affirm that we are co-creators of the future, not passive pawns. And we stand united in affirmation of our hope and vision of a just and inclusive society. We affirm the unity of all persons. We affirm brotherhood and sisterhood that allows us to touch upon each other's humanity. We affirm a unity that opens our eyes, ears, and hearts to see the different but common forms of oppression, suffering, and pain. Yet we are one in the image of God, and we celebrate our hopes for human unity. Within ourselves and within the gathered community, we will discover the strength not to hide in indifference affirming that hope publicly expressed energizes and enables us to move forward. Together, we pledge action to transcend barriers, be they racial, political, economic, social, or religious. We pledge to make our tomorrows become our todays. The final song we're going to sing together this morning is I Wish I Knew How It Would Feel to Be Free. And this is a piece a lot of people think Nina Simone wrote because she very famously performed this song a lot at jazz festivals, at protests, on recording. But it was written by Billy Taylor and Dick Dallas and made famous by the amazing Nina Simone. Let's sing this one together.
Our benediction comes from the words of Ken Wiley. Our ancestors, principles, and fellow humans are calling on us to promote, affirm, with deeds and words, Black Lives Matter. We extinguish our chalice this morning, affirming that hope publicly expressed energizes, enables us to move forward. Together, let us pledge action to transcend barriers, be they racial, political, economic, social, or religious. Let it be so. Before we sing our final benediction, um, we've got a lot to talk about, friends, don't we? So we want to invite you all to coffee hour. It's a virtual coffee hour. And to get there, what you need to do is leave this meeting. And the next screen that pops up in your browser will have a purple coffee mug on it. Please click on that mug and join us for some conversation. Whether you're a longtime member or you're brand new this morning, um, we'd be happy to see you there. Let's sing together our closing benediction, Spirit of Life. Mm-hmm.